All right, and we have started. Let's give this a couple of moments so that people can join us. Although I would suggest we're going to kick this off fairly soon because we have a lot of people registered for this. So thank you so much for coming along. Um, okay, All right. the attendee numbers are climbing. That is very exciting. Look, we have a lot to cover. So I'd suggest let's get straight into it. And those of you who can't make it, all of this will be recorded. So hi, everyone, and welcome to our webinar. On screen, Australia's exciting new funding opportunities. I'd firstly like to acknowledge the country on which we meet. Today, I come to you from the land of the Kombumeri families of the Ugamba language region, and I invite you to think on whose land you are residing on from your location. Sovereignty was never ceded, and the lands have always been and always will be Aboriginal land. I pay my respects to elders past and present and extend my welcome to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people joining us today. So, welcome. For those who don't know me, my name is Jens, and I'm IGS Director of Industry Member Relations. If, is, if this is your first interaction with IGEA, then welcome as well. We are the Interactive Games and Entertainment Association, the peak association representing the voice of Australian companies in the computer and video games industry. In today's webinar, we'll be covering Screen Australia's new funding opportunities aimed to empower and elevate Australian game makers and boost the strength of the local sector all thanks to federal government funding to the tune of $12 million. We'll also be introducing representatives from Screen Australia to make it easier to connect and collaborate. And so I'd like to welcome today Lee Namo, Amelia Loughlin, and Chad Toprek. Thank you so much for being with us today. Lee, Amelia, and Chad will cover the fundamentals of the three new programs. The Game Production Fund, that'll be Lee. The Emerging Game Makers Fund, that'll be Amelia. And the Future Leaders Delegation, that'll be Chad. And then you will have an opportunity to ask some questions. For that, can I please ask you to use the Q&A function? You'll see that at the bottom of Zoom. So please use that and not the chat. Why? The Q&A function allows us to monitor any questions you have and we can mark them as answered. Whereas the chat, that'll just be, well, chaos. So we'll sort of lose track of anything you ask in there. Um, well, look, um, Lee, Amelia, chat, thank you so much for making it today. And um, over to you. Brilliant. Thank you, Jens. And hello, everybody. Really glad you could join us. Or if you're watching this on a recording, hope you're watching it at a convenient time and place for yourself. Um, my name is Lee Namo. I'm the head of online and games at Screen Australia. I want to start by thanking IGEA for their support and partnership on this webinar. And of course, for all that they do for the Australian games industry, which is a lot. Um, today, we're going to take you through the three new funds that we announced at GCAP uh, in October this year and uh, talk a bit about some of the information of those funds, the details, what we're looking for, and also then answer your questions, as Ian said. So let's dive right in. This is us, the games team at Screen Australia. Uh, we're all based here in Melbourne, but we do travel a lot and we take Zooms and phone calls all over the country all the time. So just so you're aware of who you're talking to today and where we come from, this is our reasonably newly formed games team, um, given that we're back in games funding since March last year. So that's a good segue into talking about where we've come from in, uh, in the last 18 months. Uh, so we reintroduced games funding in March last year. Um, we've had two rounds of the expansion pack fund, which crucially was a completion fund, to taking games to full release. And we had 282 eligible applications and we funded 62 of those. So those of you good with maths can do the conversion and the percentages of uh, the rates of what we're funding. Um, that represents $8.1 million out the door to Australian game developers, which we're super proud of. For context, we had a nominal $3 million per financial year for those two rounds and managed to find more money uh, each time because we had so many great applications. Um, we funded projects from all states and territories around the country, which is part of our remit as Screen Australia. So that's something that we intend to continue to do moving forwards. We also funded two studios through our First Nations Game Studio Fund, Guck in Victoria and Awesome Black in New South Wales. And they were given $300,000 each to continue operations and to expand. So we're super proud of the work that they're doing and hope to continue working with them and other First Nations studios across the country. Now, those two years of expansion pack were essentially funding that we found from other areas of the agency. Uh, and um, basically, it was our plan to use that to incentivize the government to make games funding a permanent fixture at Screen Australia. And in January this year, we were really, really pleased to see that our plan worked. And as part of the National Cultural Policy Revive, we were given $12 million 
for games funding for the next four years. Now, crucially, want to state that that is $12 million over four years. So that is $3 million per financial year for the next four years. So that's the amount of money we have for games funding at Screen Australia at the moment. Um, and given the implementation of the digital games tax offset, which is focused on games with budgets over $500,000, our funding will continue to prioritize games with budgets under $500,000. So that will typically be independent games. That's where we see Australia having a really exciting and thriving industry and where we intend to continue focusing our support. Hopefully you're enjoying the pictures of some of the funded games in this slideshow as well. Um, so that will give you a sense of some of the games that we've supported over the years. So that means games funding is back at Screen Australia. Um, and really excitingly, it will continue um, we've had a bit of a chance to step back and really think about the great things that Expansion Pack achieved, all of the applications that we got, all the, the millions of conversations we had with Australian game developers. And we've spent the last few months strategizing about who we want to support and where we want to focus that support. So as I said, we implemented three new games funds and announced them uh, at GCAP, and we're going to talk about them in detail now, the first of which is the Games Production Fund. Now. That is best seen as, I guess, a replacement or an evolution of the game's expansion pack. So expansion pack uh, won't continue ongoing. It's been replaced by the game's production fund. So some of the details of that fund. The game's expansion pack had a threshold of $150,000 as the maximum amount you could ask for. Game's production fund has a threshold of $100,000 that you can ask for. Now, as I said, game's expansion pack was a completion fund, whereas Listening to the developers in Australia talk about the different needs and the need for flexibility within their timelines and their development periods, Games Production Fund allows you to take your game to a significant milestone. Now, that could be full release to an audience. It could be early access. It could be taking your game to a state of development that's ready to pitch to international publishers or to take to a significant cultural um, accolade or, or festival or award. Could be something else entirely but it's really crucial that you tell us what that is you want to achieve and how you intend to get there and how Screen Australia's funding will help you achieve that. So that's in one of the um, application materials that I'll talk about in just a minute. Similar to Games Expansion Pack, you do need to be a proprietary limited company at time of applying for the Games Production Fund. The first round is open right now and the deadline is the 30th of November this year, but we've also announced the next few rounds on the website There'll be two rounds per financial year, so you'll be able to see them in advance. So if that deadline doesn't work for you, you'll be able to see when our next round opens and when it closes in advance. Now, this fund uh, is only open to projects that have not received expansion pack funding. So due to the amount of applications we get and the fact that expansion pack was a completion fund, games that were funded through expansion pack are not eligible for this fund. And we're aiming again at games with budgets under $500,000 at time of applying. Again, that is something that may change with certain games, but that's where we're aiming the support for this project and these funds. Uh, at the moment, you can't access this fund multiple times over multiple rounds with the same project. And I'm going to talk through some of the application materials that we need from you as well. The main one of those is a playable prototype. So exactly the same as Expansion Pack, you need something that we can play. That can be a gray box or a vertical slice or a demo or something else entirely, but it does need to be playable. We also ask for a production plan, which is a bit of the details of your timeline of your um, development. We have a template for this in the application form that gives us the milestones, a timeline, things like that. We also have a strategic outcomes document, which is again templated in the application form. This is more about your goals and how you'll achieve them. So I mentioned this earlier. We really, really want to know what you want to achieve with this funding and how you intend to get there. Uh, and how Screen Australia's funding is going to help. And that creative roadmap is really, really important for us to see and to understand that you've thought about this process and you know how you're going to achieve what you want to achieve. We also need a finance plan and budget, which is, again, templated in the application form. And if you're wondering what it is that we assess these applications based on, we do advertise in the guidelines the assessment criteria. So you can go through and look at all the things that we require and that we assess you on. Um, the other thing that I really want to state before throwing over to Amelia about one of our other funds is the term games and interactivity, they're really quite broad. If you feel like your application and your project operates on the fringes of those definitions and maybe is a little less easily defined as a game, 
we really encourage you to talk to us early in the application process. Please don't wait till deadline day and just submit. Um, we can help you and guide you in those conversations. There are other funds at Screen Australia that support uh, interactive media. A lot of XR projects do come through our, some of our documentary funds. And I also look after the online production fund where narrative XR projects are eligible to apply as well. Um, so it might be that your project might not be eligible for um, some of our games funding, but there might be other funds that we can talk to you about or other areas we can point you in for support. With that said, um, I'm going to throw to Amelia to talk about one of our other ongoing funds uh, and we can answer questions about games production fund later on. Thanks, Amelia. Thanks very much, Lee. Hi, everyone. Great to be here. So excitingly, I'm here to talk about a brand new fund that we have, which is called the Emerging Game Makers Fund. So as you would be aware, the game production fund that Lee just described requires a prototype for you to apply. And a significant gap that we noticed in our funding while we were doing expansion pack is the ability to make that prototype. We noticed that um, that was a sort of major barrier for a lot of people who were looking to apply, not only for our funding, but for various opportunities and funding. So we've brought in the Emerging Game Makers Fund to try to democratize that early stage of, of game making and to um, bring that opportunity to, to make something to more people, hopefully. So it's a grant of up to $30,000. So uh, a grant is a non-recoupable amount of money. That means that you don't have to pay it back to us. You just get the money and you make the game. Um, and this fund is really encouraged, uh, designed to encourage experimentation. It's aimed at emerging creators, diverse voices, and anyone at any career stage who's interested in creative and artistic experimentation. Because it doesn't require a prototype, it is prototype funding, you're going to instead come to us with an, an idea or a concept for your pitch, and you're going to come to us with sort of a plan of how you're going to make the thing, and I'll, I'll describe the application materials in detail in just a moment. Crucially for this fund, you can be a sole trader or a private company to apply, and this sort of goes with what we were saying about democratising that earlier stage. Um, if you you know, are interested in making games, but you're not incorporated yet, then this is sort of the fund that we would encourage you to be looking at. Uh, just as the game production fund will operate as two rounds per financial year, the Emerging Game Makers Fund will operate on the same schedule. So the first round is open now and it closes on the 30th of November this year. But if that doesn't work for you, we do have round two and three dates already up on our guidelines page. And the next round will be between Feb and April 2024. So um, there'll be plenty of opportunities for you to apply. When we're doing expansion pack, we had sort of limited rounds. Um, but for this funding, as Lee said at the top, we've got four years of guaranteed funding. So there will be other opportunities if, if this particular round doesn't suit you. So a few, I guess, more esoteric questions about this fund. Uh, am I emerging? You might be asking yourself looking at this fund. Um, and I know that this can be confusing because for some um, organizations, the term emerging is used to refer to age or a certain career stage or levels of um, like years of experience making games. Uh, we don't have uh, that type of description for emerging for this fund in particular, that's not part of the eligibility criteria. Emerging can mean somebody who's very young and just sort of starting to make games, but it could also mean someone who's undergoing a career change and getting into games, um, someone who's an artist in a different field and looking to try making games, or you could be somebody with heaps of commercial experience working in other studios who's looking to um, sort of build their own creative practice as an individual. Any of those people could be considered emerging under this fund. The next question uh, that I thought people might have, what is considered creative or experimental? So this is a really good question. I guess one of the best ways to think about this is probably to look at the criteria on our guidelines. One of the areas of criteria is creative merit, and we talk there about the sorts of things uh, that are competitive um, in this fund. But basically what is creative or experimental really has a lot to do with what's going on in the realm of game making. So uh, 
you know, being familiar with sort of what's been done and, and what hasn't and how your work sort of maybe push the bounds of what has or hasn't been done before. Something to avoid would be being weird for weird's sake. So we're not looking for, uh, you know, a, a, a known game format with some layer of weird over it just for the sake of it. That's not really what we're looking for. We're really looking for originality and people who are sort of taking creative risks in what they're doing and building. And um, when I say creative risks, I don't just mean art style. You could be doing something really technically interesting. You could be doing something really narratively interesting. You could be building a technical narrative system that does something really interesting. Uh, games are all sorts of different um, disciplines. So experimentation in any of those is, is of interest to this fund. In terms of the application materials, we're looking for a pitch video where you're going to talk about the creative vision, uh, what are the aims of the project? Why do you want to make this? If you've ever done a statement of artist's intent, that sort of reasoning of why you're trying to make this and how that's going to contribute to your practice, that sort of thing is what we'd love to hear in your video. We're also looking for a creative pitch deck, which is a, a slide deck, but crucially, it's not the same as the sort of slide deck that you would use to pitch to an investor. It's a creative deck. So we've templated this material, the template is available on our guidelines and in the application form. Uh, there's a lot of information in there about the sort of things to include on the slides. Uh, the amount of information on each area is really going to depend on what your game is because some games are more systems heavy than others, some games are more narratively heavy than others. So you should certainly give us um, information as is relevant to your project in particular, but the sorts of things that could be in this deck could be uh, mood boards, concept art and sketches, information about the audio or soundscape that you're thinking for your game, narrative overview, um, systems, mapping systems, um, trees, anything like that. It really depends on what sort of game you're making. Um, but as I said, the template does include a lot of great questions to get you started in that. So you've got the creative pitch deck and then you've also got a project plan. The creative pitch deck is really about the creative vision for your project. The project plan is about the practicalities of how you're going to do that. Because even though this is a fund that is targeting more creative ideas, we still expect you to have a good idea of how you're going to build the thing that you're trying to build. So that document is looking more for some practical details about your project. It's also templated, lots of good questions in there to get you started. Um, we're also looking for the CVs of your team members as part of this application. And there's a brief budget, there's no separate budget document, but within the application form itself, there is a brief uh, line item budget that you'll need to fill in. We understand that that's probably gonna be dominated by wages for the people making the game. That's fine. Uh, that's very normal for, for this sort of funding. And I will now pass over to Chad to talk about one of our other new funds. Thanks, Amelia. So, <clears throat> I'd like to tell you a bit about our brand new uh, Future Leaders Delegation Initiative. With this program, we really want to acknowledge the importance of traveling internationally to find and connect with your community and your peers. We also want to acknowledge how challenging this can be for early to mid-career game makers in Australia, as it can cost thousands of dollars to travel to an event like GDC, the Game Developers Conference in San Francisco. But we all know that incredible opportunities come about from attending these conferences and festivals in person, face to face. So we're really excited that the Future Leaders Delegation Program will start with GDC 2024 and will support five early to mid career game makers from underrepresented backgrounds with $8,000 of funding to cover travel costs, your GDC pass and living expenses. In terms of eligibility, applicants must not have been to GDC before. They must have released at least one game publicly and must currently be working on at least one game. Applications are now open and the deadline is 5 p.m. on the 9th of November 2023. Um, we see this funding as more than just travel assistance, as we really want to create a safe, caring and informed delegation that grows and becomes future leaders. Which is why, in addition to the funding, Screen Australia will support successful grant applicants um, with domestic travel and accommodation to Melbourne 
to attend a pre-departure workshop that includes mentorship, presentations, and networking opportunities. A quick overview of application materials. In your application, we basically wanted you to tell us um, why you want to go, how this opportunity will benefit you, and who you'd like to meet when you're there. There's two main documents that we're asking for. A CV that includes details of any commercial or non-commercial work, festival awards, speaking opportunities, or, or volunteer work. And then the second document is a career development proposal, where we, want, where we want to see how this opportunity will benefit you and your career. Um, we want to see an overview of your past and current works, and a brief description of your career objectives and how GDC will aid in achieving them. And finally, we want to see a list of up to five local and up to five international game makers that you'd like to meet and learn and hear from. You don't already have to have met these people. We just want to know that you're doing research and planning out your trip um, to make the most out of it. If you're interested in applying, please read through the guidelines. And we've got an amazing FAQ document for all three um, grants, actually, that'll help you out with any questions that you might have. So I'll hand it back over to Lee to tell you about one other opportunity that we have. Thanks, Chad. Thanks, Amelia. Just quickly wanted to mention the Skills Development Fund. It comes under a different area of Screen Australia's, Australia's funding, but it might be relevant to some of the medium or larger studios out there. So this uh, Skills Development Fund, uh, game studios are eligible to apply for up to $80,000 for a training plan. Now, crucially, this is for training and development costs, not for wages of staff being trained. But essentially, we're asking the industry and game studios to identify what are some dire training needs that they may have and how can that be addressed with this funding? That could be management training and leadership training. It could be training staff to pivot from mobile to console. It could be training in a new games engine. You tell us what that training is and how you intend to achieve it. Uh, and uh, you can apply, as I said, for up to $80,000 for that. Now, the first deadline for that round is on the 26th of October, but I believe the very next day, a new fund will open, a new round will open, I should say, um, and they're rolling for the next few months. So you'll be able to apply uh, ongoing. If you have any questions about that, best to reach out to industrydevelopment at screenaustralia.gov.au to, to check if your studio is eligible. And uh, we have a, a team there who can chat to you about that. So that's a broader fund that's open to other areas of screen as well as games, but trying to incorporate games into other areas of the agency now that it's back as a permanent addition to our funding. Uh, we're just about done. Here's a bit of a brief summary of the grants we've talked through today, those three funds that are part of the game suite that we've announced, just to give a bit of a recap. If you want to take a screenshot, um, this webinar will be recorded, as we said, so you can revisit this. The Games Production Fund, the Emerging Game Makers Fund, and the Future Leaders Delegation are all open now. And... You can scan this QR code to go to the games landing page, which contains links to all of the guidelines for these funds on our website. Now, we, as Chad said, we really encourage you to read the guidelines and FAQs for these funds before you contact us. That will probably answer most of your questions, to be honest. Um, if it doesn't, you can reach out to our games, uh, our program operations team via the games at screenaustralia.gov.au email or call that number on your screen to, I've got to sound like an infomercial, call the number on your screen to speak to somebody if you would like to. Um, however, as I said, it does really help us if you've read the guidelines and have a few questions prepared um, because they, they may answer your questions. Uh, I've tried to answer a few questions in the Q&A, but um, I'll throw back to Jens now and he can uh, throw us some of the questions and we can answer them as best we can live. Yeah, Thanks. thank you so much, Lee. God, hardest working man in the games business. I saw you typing away furiously. Thank you so much for doing <laughs> that. Look, um, again, thank you so much for doing this. And what a fantastic program, or rather fantastic program. It's really great to see that, you know, you've really, um, you know, closing all the gaps. I really appreciate you also looking after more experimental games. So really, really great stuff there. The questions are coming in hard and fast. We currently have 31 in the Q&A section. So let's get uh, let's get get straight to it. So an anonymous attendee is asking, with the Games Production Fund, can we employ the team as freelance contractors as opposed to employees, including the key creative members? I'm happy to take this if you like. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so yes, you can. How you employ people is sort of the business of your business, really. We don't have um, 
any uh, definitions about how you have to do that. What you'll want to look at is our terms of trade to make sure that the way that you're employing people is in line with the minimum standard of what we would expect. In our uh, new finance plan and budget template, we have separated out salaried workers and contract workers. This is just so we can understand how much people are being paid. There was a lot of ambiguity in the expansion pack around what the nature of somebody's employment was and how employed they were. So I guess we would just encourage anybody who's um, using a contract structure to be really clear about how much time people are working and, and those sorts of things, just so that we know uh, that you're meeting our terms of trade. Yeah, look, really good point. One thing I'd caution you about is sham contracting. So just be mindful of that. We do have an HR resource on the AGIA website. So maybe have a look at that as well to ensure that you're also within the confines of the law. Another question that we have, I just heard that the Emerging Game Makers Fund is recoupable. Was this the same for the Games Production Fund? Yes, and we should have said all of these funds are grants. And so we don't require recoupment on them. It becomes your money. So Take it, make sure you meet our obligations in the contract and go and make something great and uh, enjoy enjoy your life with this money. Enjoy <laughs> your, your game making life. <laughs> Excellent advice. Um, are there any resources we could refer to to become a Pro Propriety Limited company to be legible? There's some general resources that the government provides. I think it's the business, um, the federal business website. It's actually linked on our guidelines, I believe, uh, where we talk about the different company structures. We link to some resources about basically starting a small business. These are just sort of generic government um, resources. They're not specific to games, but uh, they're definitely some good checklists of the sorts of considerations that you need to take if you're going to incorporate yeah, good the other thing add, sorry, and the other thing I'd add on that is that we would encourage you to engage an accountant and a lawyer to help you navigate that process. That's that kind of falls under, as Amelia was saying before, part of your business of running your business. Yeah, look, that's right. That's really good advice. And get it right from the start in case there are any ramifications later in terms of ownership and all of that. You really want to make sure that everybody's on the same page before you become successful, which inevitably you will. Um, the original expansion pack had a limit of two failed applications per game. Is this still the case? And are those who failed twice during the old fund able to apply for the new funds? Yeah, I want to say that we still have that two strike rule. Um, so for projects that get um, knocked back twice, um, that particular project will no longer be eligible. That doesn't bar the, the studio or the developers themselves coming back to us with with a brand new project, um, but for that particular project, yeah. And for the second part about expansion pack, uh, all sins have been removed. You have a clean slate. <laughs> you can, it, it's a separate fund. So basically, yeah, it doesn't count. But we we did we did want to clarify. I think it's worth clarifying. It's really worth thinking about if you did receive one or more declines through expansion pack. Think about what are you bringing back to us that's a different offering or how has the game evolved since then because um it is going to be very very competitive we expect to get a lot of applications um and and we really expect to be only able to fund probably between 15 and 20 games through the games production fund and similar through the emerging game makers fund per financial year and with the large volume of applications if, if you've been declined a couple of times really think about what it is that you bring back to us that's different yeah, look, thank you for bringing it up because that relates to um, the next question. If you're not back for the emerging fund in November, can you hit back the drawing board and reapply for the next round, even with the same idea, just tweaked? Yeah, I want to say you can, but we, like Lee said, we want to see how your your application has developed. Um, the last thing we want to see is the, the same identical application being reapplied. Um, think about you know um how you can improve that that application and and your your prototype if it's for the games production fund yeah mm -hmm. i believe the wording in the guidelines is there must be evidence of meaningful changes between applications so you are eligible to apply with the same project again but if it's exactly the same materials and there's been no changes that is kind of questionable to us so yeah you need to show evidence that you've sort of gone back and, and done a bit of work I might just 
deviate for a second to our feedback process moving forward because we uh, do want to give people feedback. We do really find our resources are limited for this and we want to give people meaningful feedback. So when you apply, if you're unsuccessful, we will be sending out a standard decline email with also an attachment that will take you through the trends and themes of that round of funding. So it won't be specific to your application, but it will give you a sense of what we saw that was standing out and what wasn't. Then if you do intend to reapply, we can organize when the next round opens, a brief pre-application um, chat to talk through your game. But um, you won't get specific feedback at time of being unsuccessful if you are unsuccessful. If you're reapplying, we'll give you a, a, a quick chat to talk through the feedback so that you're well positioned to incorporate that. Excellent. Well, thank you, team. Um, I think the next question somewhat relates to the things that you raised. Can a project be eligible for multiple rounds of the production fund? For example, could you apply to the November fund to fund a particular milestone and then reapply to take the project to release? At this stage, the answer to that is no. We have had that question a few times, but uh, because of the volume of applications we expect, uh, we don't intend to be funding projects multiple times through the games production fund. To clarify, you could get the Emerging Game Makers Fund and come back to us in future rounds for the Games Production Fund. And that would be a valid and expected pipeline for a lot of um, projects. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. And then I, off I to guess, the DGTL. Yeah, <laughs> hopefully. I think it's good to, to keep in mind the realities of the amount of funding available as well when asking about these sort of multiple applications. We had, I think, around 280 applications all up for Expansion Pack. And out of that, we were able to fund 62 game so you can kind of do the maths on on what we were able to do and we expect that as word of mouth travels we're just going to see more and more applications so um yeah i suppose it's really through a lens of like fairness and trying to spread out help as far as we can that we're sort of in that position yeah great thank you um do you encourage university-based teams to apply for the emerging game makers funds it's in the guidelines students are not eligible for our funding so if you are currently studying games or a field related to games you are not eligible to apply once you've graduated you're welcome to but uh, there can be complicated conflicts of interest if you're completing coursework and you're also applying for government funding there's also the question of um, IP ownership that it, it's yeah quite complicated so at the moment no you would not be eligible yeah, thank you. Good point. Um, because be mindful, some universities may own the IP that you work on. Um, Section 8 of the Game Production Fund application talks about copyright and clearances. Do we need to get some legal documents stating that we are the IP, no, IP owners of our game? Do you require a solicitor's chain of title opinion letter for your game at both time of um, approval for funding and contracting and then at the end of uh, delivery? So we get to two of those solicitors the chain of title letters. Again, I would refer you to a, a lawyer to talk about that in terms of to make sure that you've got the, the required documentation uh, in order to apply. Well, thank you. Um, a question here from Amos. Do you recommend reaching out to you and discuss the project before applying for the Emerging Game Makers Fund? Um, you can reach out if you've got any questions regarding um, the application and the application process. We don't give specific um, feedback on how to make your grant better or more competitive. Um, but if there's any confusion around what's expected or um, or what the application is asking, you can definitely reach out and we'll we'll clarify that for you. Fantastic. You don't have to though. Just just to clarify that, like because yes. of the volume of applications and the amount of people that that we're talking to across the country, we. We just can't talk to everybody who's going to apply. So don't feel like if you've got all your questions answered, you don't have to kind of run your game bias or your project bias to get a kind of cool, you're coming in. It's It'd be lovely if we could manage that volume, but we we don't think we can. Fair enough. Um, Jason is asking, can I apply if I'm making a non-digital game or a game that combines digital and analog spaces? Uh, this is also in the guidelines. No, it's not eligible to have a basically a non-screen project where Screen Australia we have to fund um, digital projects that are entirely digital so yeah sorry but no not eligible no clear answer on that one uh, Billy is asking are projects applying to the emerging game makers fund still expected to have some sort of commercial aspirations of viability are projects with no commercial aspirations or artistic ones less competitive um I would say no, you don't, they're not 
less competitive um, and not really expected to have commercial aspirations or viability. I think the one of the great things about the Emerging Game Makers Fund is you can use it to create a prototype. And if you feel like the prototype isn't really leading anywhere um, and has no commercial viability, that's totally okay. We'd like to think of it as giving you the time and the space to experiment and to learn and to hopefully come up with a prototype that you can take somewhere or, or just to create a small, you know, micro scale project that's complete. I think we are. Yeah, I think that's that's all definitely true. It doesn't have to be commercial, but I think what we do want to know is that you're clear about why you're making what you want to make, even if it isn't for a commercial outcome, you know, obviously like skill building and um, sort of furthering your creative practice are, are things that we would want to see as well. Um, I think, yeah, there's sort of a line between like, oh, I just want to muck around in this engine and oh, I found this really cool thing I can do in this engine. I want to experiment with it further. You know, we are looking for something that's a bit more of a defined direction that you want to take your, your practice. Um, but yeah, the commercial aspect is, is not compulsory for this fund. Yeah, great. I Thank think, you. I think com competitive applications will have a clear intention and goal um as to why they they're going about applying yeah just like any other art you know you don't just do it for its own sake um we do have a question here which i think you'll probably be able to answer very quickly is there support for us as we go through the application process can somebody can somebody review our application before we submit it yes to the first part no to the second we can't um pre-assess applications uh we can answer your questions as chad said and we can help you demystify what we're looking for in those questions but um Again, we'd encourage you to read the guidelines with the FAQs, rewatch this webinar, uh, have a look at the templates for the application form um, before reaching out to us. Also, like anybody in your life can help you with that sense checking, I think. Like, I think uh, there's a temptation to be like, oh, this is a games thing, like my mom or my aunt or whatever, like wouldn't necessarily want to see my um, you know, my document or my creative pitch, but I think just being coherent and really clear in your application materials is something that's really important. And sometimes showing your pitch video to like, you know, your brother who is not at all interested in, in your work, that might be the best thing that you can do because, um, you know, we're like your, your brother when we see your pitch video, we've never heard anything about your project before. We're totally blank slate. So it can, um, you know, be good to, to sense check things against uh, other people as well. Yeah, good call. Thank you. Um, an anonymous attendee is asking, so for the Emerging Game Makers Fund, the priority is on creative or experimental games only, more traditional games are not considered? I feel like we kind of answered this. It's pretty, it, it's broad. It's it's kind of both and in, everywhere in between, as long as you're clear on what your goals are. Um, yeah, thanks. Well, can the Emerging Game Makers Fund purchase hardware? Is there a limit in terms of percentage? There's no hard percentage. I think it's all about being reasonable and the cost being justified. So um, hardware is certainly something that can be really important to game development, but you know it's a $30,000 grant, so it has to be reasonable within the scale of the grant. So if you're spending more than half of that on, a, on some hardware, then we're gonna question that. That's probably an unreasonable expense. But if you specifically are wanting to use like, I don't know, the IK or the something movement of the Joy-Cons or the Switch and you want a dev kit so that you can do that. Um, you know, that's it's all about the context and how reasonable the expense is. So I, I think, yeah, there's no set percentage, but it's like be sensible in what you're doing with the money because you do have to report back to us through an acquittal process. There you go. Um, will developers applying for the Emerging Game Makers Fund need to provide a complete price breakdown of the expected costs slash where the money will be going? For example, budget allocation for contractors. Yeah, for Emerging Game Makers Fund, the budget requirements are reasonably um, light, I would say. We do require a budget breakdown as you apply in the application form. Um, I'm just going to remind myself of the specific wording. Um, but yeah, we would we'd like to know where the budget is going and breaking that um, up to thirty thousand dollars down uh, into the the line items is required at the time of applying. We expect that it may change over the course of the acquitting the grant and spending it and developing the game, and that's why we have an acquittal process where you tell us, here's what I said I was going to spend the money on, and here's where it spent. 
here's what I did spend it. If there's big differences as, you, as you're going through the development of the game, best to reach out to your investment manager, which will be one of us to update us and to run a bias as to why. Great, thank you. Um, we have two questions here, which pretty much come to come down to the same thing. Do all team members need to be located in Australia? Is it okay if someone is not based in Australia and is part of the team? Yep. So because this is Australian government funding, there is a requirement that at least 90% of expenditure happens onshore. So with with the funding, that, that's of our money that we're giving you. So if you have a budget with multiple funding sources, you can finance your international team members however you like, but it is yeah a maximum of 10% of our money that you could spend offshore, basically. And we do state in the guidelines that uh, project the project must be under the key creative control of Australian citizens or permanent residents and be predominantly developed in Australia. Um, I think that's one if if you'd have instances that would maybe fall outside of that, it's worth having a chat to us beforehand to clarify if you're eligible or not. Mm -hmm. yeah, makes sense. Australian taxpayers' money going back to Australians. <laughs> um, there is a question here from 12230, which relates to that, and I think you, you pretty much answered it, but let me read it out anyway. Is there a specific requirement for how the invested funds must be spent? For instance, can they be used to pay developer salaries? Are developers required to be local residents? For example, if we outsource South Design, can it be considered an outsourcing project? Can we outsource to other countries? I think you pretty much explained Yeah, that. I think we covered that earlier. Um... <clears throat> Um, I like. I think it would be expected that most of the the funding would go towards salaries. Um, like Amelia said, there's there is an expectation that ninety percent of that expenditure is is within Australia. Um, that doesn't mean that you can't have um, people overseas. It just means that you'll have to finance their salaries external to our funding. Yeah, good call. Speaking of salaries, there's a question here. Could Amelia please clarify what the expectations are for much of the ask will be spent on wages, particularly for solo developer? Amelia, I think that relates to you talking about how some of the money in the Emerging Game Makers Fund, that there is an expectation that a lot of it will be spent on, on, on salaries. So could you clarify that a bit further? Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, you can break down your budget however you want but in our experience so far the main thing that it takes to make games is people so people means wages and in screen australia's terms of trade which is what all of our programs operate under um, those terms people have to be paid at least minimum wage through screen australia funding so if you are a solo developer and you are working on your own project and you get our funding you need to show us in your budget that you're at least paying yourself minimum wage in order to for your application your work with us to be um, lawful so that's just sort of the minimum um, expectation in terms of like uh, the amount of the funding that has to go to wages there's no sort of set amount but um, it's just usually what most of the money goes towards because people make games they're the ones making them <laughs> great thank you Amelia um, we have a very interesting question here from an anonymous attendee who's asking, does the 500,000K, sorry, 500K project limit include in-kind work? And if so, do you have any advice for people who have large amounts of in-kind work, but perhaps minimal monetary investment? Yeah, for Games Expansion Pack, we um, made a distinction that uh, if money had changed hands, if people were paid for roles, that that counted towards that $500,000 limit. But if it was prior to it applying to us, there was in-kind work or sweat equity, that didn't because it would very quickly, could potentially very quickly get your game above that 500 k budget without any money actually coming into the, the game. So we'll make a same, the same distinction here for the games production fund in terms of if there's actual money that's changed hands in terms of paying people for their roles or paying people for the work, even if it's minimal, that should be in the finance plan and budget. If it hasn't and it's just been in-kind work, then you don't need to, to count that. So hopefully that will mean that your game's budget, if it's largely in-kind work, is under $500,000 when you apply to us. Great. Thank you, Lee. Um, Aiden is asking, do Game Jam games count towards one game released for the future leaders delegation? Yeah, absolutely. Um, as long as the game is publicly released, like on Itch or Steam, that's totally okay. 
Great, thank you. Well, that was straightforward. Matty is asking, what kind of support exists for building the career development proposal? In the guidelines, there's a list there. It says up to 1,000 words, and we've got a bullet point list of what we are after for that career development proposal, including how the opportunity would benefit you, overview of your career and past projects, your current career objectives. It's all there in the guidelines. Um, it, it, what we're looking for there is that there's some thought and some strategy around your career and, and where you want it to go, basically. But it doesn't need to be too rigorous. Hopefully, 1,000 words is uh, still meets that definition of not too rigorous. <laughs> Thank you, Lee. Anthony is asking, can you apply for the Games Production Fund and the Future Leaders Fund? Yes. <laughs> Easiest one to answer. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Um, Scott's asking, with the Games Production Fund, do we include costs incurred prior to our proprietary company creation date in our total budget and cost report? For example, company creation costs, prior software, hardware, wage costs, and so on. Uh, yes, basically would be the short answer, but think about what Lee just said about in-kind uh, work versus uh, work that was compensated with money changing hands. So the only thing that you wouldn't count is that in-kind work that was not paid. But if you have, you know, bought things for this project in particular, if you have clear records that you can, you know, that you know when you started spending money towards this project and you know what those costs are, um, yes, we would expect to see that sort of stuff reflected in your finance plan and your budget. Hey, excellent. Mitch is asking for the future leaders delegation for the selection criteria, could someone who has worked on a commercial game be eligible to network to potentially find work overseas to then eventually come back to Australia as a more experienced professional? Um, that's a, that's a tricky one. I don't think we, like, I don't think we would be wanting to, to fund people to like set up shop overseas. Um, we want to, we want to be able to build a, a delegation program that brings that knowledge back home, um, that ultimately benefits developers in Australia. I think brain drain is a, is a real thing. And, um, because it is public money, we want to ensure that that is is um, spent on on Australians in our shore. Yeah, fair enough. Also, Mitch, don't go. We miss you. Um, another one is attendee is asking, what are you looking for in team member CVs as someone without games industry experience or specific um, experience to the games industry? Should I be adapting my CV to focus on game work and skills? Your CV should reflect the body of your work. I think if you're applying for games funding, it should be prioritized and focused towards the games work you've done. But if that's minimal, then even the fact that you've shipped or just say shipped, you've created and finished other creative projects is really valuable to us to see that that might be, you know, it might be plays, it might be a web series, it might be a book. So seeing that you can take something from start to finish creatively is really important to us. I'm sure there's many CV creation guides out there on uh, on the website as well. So it might be worth looking at some of those and looking at CVs of people that you uh, think are doing a good job because that CV must have helped them get there. I would also say if you're very either early in your career or your career changing, I think showing your full like work history or like your history is is of interest to us. If you're changing jobs, it's you know, it's interesting for us to see where you've come from, if that's part of the flavor of your application of, you know, I'm swapping. And if you are, um, you know, really young and you're going for it as well, um, you know, I wouldn't break down every single thing you ever did at your Woolworths service job, but those sorts of jobs do tell us something about who you are and your character and your history. So um, I wouldn't say like to shy away from your varied experiences. Um, I worked for my dad's small business when I was um, very young and processing invoices is a skill that I learned then that I still use today. So there are things that can come back. Um, running game studios is running a business. So there's lots of things that could be relevant. Yeah, very good point. If you were a team leader, well, or something, definitely put it in there because that is very valuable. You somewhat covered it previously, but Bren's asking here about micro games. Do they count when it comes to the future leaders fund? It's a game I've made before starting my company, and its main purpose was to learn how to create games while making a game. I would yeah. say yes, as long as it's um, publicly available. Um, the the thing that we want to see when in regards to having worked on a game in the past and currently working on a game is that you're taking 
game development seriously as 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 a as a career. Excellent. Thank you. Brendan is asking a pretty interesting question. How do you work with other agencies? Can we get a similar grant both from Screen Australia and Screen Queensland? Who should take priority? Can we double dip? Yeah, and we wouldn't say this double dipping as long as the budget outlines that you're not using funds from multiple agencies to pay for one line item. So you would just need to include them in your finance plan and budget. Let us know if it's confirmed or proposed. Um, but that's something that we see all the time. Again, it's not required. It can make your application more competitive, especially if you've got funding confirmed from another agency or source. We, that gives us comfort that, oh, someone else has backed this and has, has seen um, potential in this project. Um, in terms of who takes priority, I'm not quite sure I understand that, but it would be other sources are, are valuable in there. Do, do you do you want to maybe provide more information on what you mean by priority? Because we would just see that as um we're, we're all contributing to make this game and to help finance it. Maybe the best way to think about it. Yeah. And I guess priorities probably an informed guess will be when it comes to a sort of um, similar support mechanisms, i.e. travel grants. And that's, I would assume also, you know, what I was referring to double dipping. Um, anyway, put it in the Q&A. We'll um, check that. But in the meantime, we do have another question here from Dave, who's asking, I am... Uh, the business owner and also working on this project full time. Should I consider myself as a salary worker in the budget sheet? Uh, if that's the nature of your employment, then yes. If you're employed by your own company, um, it, I guess again that's sort of like a question of your own business and how you're you're running it. Um, but yeah, I can't really answer that for you. I'm sorry. All right. Uh, well, let's get to the next question from Brian. For the Emerging Game Makers Fund, it outlines some rules around student teams and companies who are employing students. As someone who will be graduating, will I be able to work with a team where some members are graduating in the following year? Is referring a solution. Again, you somehow covered that when we talk about student yeah. games. Yeah, so the way to think about this is the eligibility criteria is at the time that you apply. So in the guidelines, it says what you can or cannot be at the point of application. So if you're a student, when you're applying, you're not eligible. So we would just recommend that you apply later when you are not a student. Um, yeah. But I should clarify, this is if you're a student of games or a field related to games, if you're studying something totally unrelated, then um, this you know, criteria doesn't apply. Great, thank you for clarifying. Um, and anonymous attendees asking, can a portion of an application for an emerging game makers fund be used to travel and attend such events as PAX to experience how other developers present their upcoming games and basically learn a bit on the ground? How the scene, immerse yourself, you know, how do you run a booth? How do you market? How do you create awareness and so on? I, I mean, we haven't been asked this one before. Lee, do you want to go? Uh, yeah, let's see if our answers correlate. Um, <laughs> I would say it's not um, out of the question, but it also you'd, that would probably want to be a pretty small percentage, I would imagine. The purpose, the main purpose of that fund is to help you create a prototype. If you can justify that attending those events is vital to the creation of that prototype, then I, I challenge you to convince us with your application. Make it yeah. uh, undeniable. Yeah. I think it's yeah. like what Chad was saying before about um, what's your goal. Like if, if there's something really specific or if like there's a showcase that have invited you to be part of their thing, um, if you're making a turtle game and there's heaps of other turtle games and you're going to have this great event at PAX and it's really going to help you to be amongst that network and, um, you know, to meet other people in that space, then, yeah, basically, like Lee said, convince us that that's, yeah. that's viable no, I agree. for you. I think the, the most important thing is that it relates back to the project that you're working on. Um, the Emerging Game Makers Fund isn't a travel grant. And so at the end of the day, we want to see most of that going towards the creation of the game. Cool. All right. Uh, we do have some more questions here, quite a bit, actually. So um, let's have a look what else is there. I think the next one will be pretty straightforward. Will you provide detailed feedback on rejected submissions? I guess that's a no. You've already covered that previously. Yeah, I mean, we already mentioned we don't really have the capacity to do that. What we're going to do is send a summary of the trends and themes of the rounds to everyone. And if you want to reapply, we can have a 15 minute pre-application chat with you once the new round opens. Fantastic. 
Um, I'm just going to um, scan through some of these questions to see if there are any that we haven't really touched upon yet. So Oliver is asking, uh, can a game with educational elements be legible for the Games Production Fund? Yes. <laughs> yes, serious games are eligible. Excellent. Fantastic. Stuart is asking, with the recent news about Unity's controversial changes to runtime fees, what would happen if a game engine introduced something really weird or new that would make one's application ineligible? happened before time of applying then that's something you need to address to make sure your application is eligible if we've approved your fund your your project and then something changes that's out of your control that's part of our job as investment managers to work with you to help you deliver what we're funding you to deliver so i think on a, on a case-by-case -case basis if you've been funded and something happens that's completely out of your control then let us know as soon as possible and we're we're here on your side to help you solve that problem yeah, great. Um, someone related to the serious games question, are there any concerns over funding projects that are part of practice-led academic research? Uh, we do say that uh, games that are for a business-to-business -business application or games that will not be released to the general public are not eligible. So it would depend on the nature of the research and what the game is. I think... Um, at the end of the day, neither of the funds are really aimed at research-led games. So I think looking at the criteria, it may be tricky to find a fit. But if you're doing some project and it's a really good fit with one of the funds, then, you know, maybe that's one of those cases where you should talk to us. As long as it doesn't contradict with the, with the student eligibility criteria, I would say. That's with uh, regards to the student. There was a question in there. Does this apply to games that a student may make in their private time as opposed to something that they're doing for the university course? Yeah, if you're a student at time of applying, you're not eligible. So it doesn't matter if you're doing it outside of the coursework. Um, you need to graduate at time of applying. All right, um, thank you. Let's see what else we have here. I've seen a question here before with regards to um, if there are any restrictions around crypto technology NFTs, including as payment methods, i.e. you know, accepted uh, currency for DLC or content. Um, I guess something to be mindful of in the context of the Asian countries where that is fairly prominent. Yeah, this is in our guidelines. Um, we don't accept applications that use uh, uh, high risk and volatile trading products in their mechanics. So, yep. All right. Thank you. Uh, okay. Let's see what else we have. As an individual, as a non programmer going for the Emerging Game Makers Fund, how important is it to have a team already established for the application? I think it definitely makes your application more competitive if you can come to us and say, I have um x number of people confirmed um with letters of support even stating that they're confirmed um and their cvs come to go along with it i think adding information like that will definitely make your application more competitive yeah great Got looking at the time i think we have about two minutes left and 39 open questions so maybe you can sort of go a couple of minutes over time i will however say what we're going to do is once this webinar is over we will send the open questions to the team at screen australia so zoom has a function where we can collate all that and then they can maybe reflect it in their faq so your questions will not just go into the ether um, all right, let's see what else we have. Um, we've been working on the project for a year, and in the finance plan sheet, should we include money that already has been spent on the project, like worker salaries? Yeah, if it's um, been money that's changed hands, then yes, it should be part of your finance plan and budget when you apply. Excellent. Um, we sort of answered that. Uh, what kinds of things can we do as a team of part-timers of mixed experience to give us the best chance with the Emerging Game Makers Fund? Uh, I think just really consider the viability of what you're proposing, just making it clear what your other obligations are and what your capacity is to complete this project is a really common thing for people to be working a different job and also working part time on a games project. So it's definitely not a problem. Um, just being really clear about uh, the scope of what you're doing and why that's viable. 
Yeah, great. Thank you. There's a good question here regarding ratings. Do all games need to be geared towards any specific rating? If we have a game that would likely be rated for a more mature audience, would we have a higher chance for an application to be unsuccessful? No. There is an... Oh, sorry. <laughs> there, a... there is... Okay. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, so all games released um, through our grants need to be classifiable. Um, within Australia. I think that's the only um, criteria that we have when it comes to classification. Yeah, I mean, it is it is government money, but um, we've funded all sorts of different genres and types of games so far. You can have a look on um, our website and press releases to see the sort of breadth of what we've funded. And certainly there's the mature themes in, in games that were funded already. So it doesn't, it's not gonna cast you out of the pool early or anything. Yeah, hey, great, thank you. Um, we have a question here for Matthew. Can the training you apply for be, be for non-games? So, for example, we're a skilled developer or skilled developers, and we're teaching NDIS participants. I would love to be able to get occupational therapy training for my staff. This is for the Skills Development Fund. Lee, did I you think want so. to? Uh, I was just going to say that that fund, if you are referring to the Skills Development Fund, is open to other non-games production companies across other areas of screen but crucially would need to be for screen-based content and industry training needs. So I suspect what you're describing wouldn't be eligible, but if you do have questions and think you are, please reach out to industrydevelopment at screenaustralia.gov.au. Um, but again, it's for screen-based content. Yeah, great. Thank you, Lee. There's a good question here regarding the documentation for the Emerging Game Makers Fund because it asks for a diversity, equity, and inclusion plan. I haven't written one of these personally, so what kind of plan would it be? Are there any examples that I could refer to? Yeah, so I think in the template, we ask a few questions about, you know, what, where is your team now? Where do you want to get to? And how are you going to do that? I would, I would um, advise starting with reflecting on those questions. There's plenty of resources about this online, um, YouTube videos, seminars, workshops. There's plenty of, of resources you can use out there to educate yourself. But I don't think we specifically ask for a d and plan, do we? It's not a specific whole plan. It is one of the questions in the template. So, yeah, that is another good point. And I'm sort of thinking about saying that um, all of the questions within the template, there is a page limit to how long each of the templated documents can be. So we're not looking for the same sort of DNI plan that, you know, like a AAA studio is going to have that 60 pages long. We're just looking for you to express an awareness of how this dynamic operates in your team, like what that means for you, where you're at and, and where you want to be. Yeah, great. Thank you. Maybe we have time for like what, three more questions. I'm trying to answer some in the chat as well. <laughs> uh, uh, all right, excellent. Um, look, there's one here again regarding to um, to students making games, and essentially comes down to the questions: How can we prove that we're no longer students and you're finished, but but maybe you don't have the paperwork yet? What can we do to prove that we're well finally out of there? We don't ask for any proof. That you just so when you apply to us, everything in your application you have to tick a box to say it's legal and true. So it's basically your word in the application form. Okay. And I guess if that doesn't turn out to be true, um, that's, that's probably not good. Not good. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right, there you go. Uh, what happens if after receiving a games production fund grant, the budget for the game blows out over the $500,000 limits? That would be one that would come under, talk to us if that's looking likely to happen. Um, in general, our mission is to support Australian game developers succeed and if success uh, means that your game has gotten a bigger budget with investment from elsewhere we do not intend to take the money back from you um, so that's going to be on a case-by-case -case basis as to how we deal with it but um, can say that we we would see that as a success story rather than anything negative as long as it's not you trying to hoodwink us uh, with a budget that's eligible for the DGT at time of applying but that's that's not for here and now be great um, Matt's asking, are there any ranges for pay rates for specific type of type of jobs? For example, a programmer should get X, an artist should get Y per hour. And are there any guides available somewhere? You know, how much should you be paying people? Yeah, our guidelines link to the Game Workers Australia, um, like awards rates. I think that's a really great place to start if you are unsure of what rates to pay your workers, um, check out the Game Workers Australia website. 
Yeah, look, that is very good advice. And I would also encourage you to look at the HR resource on the RGM website. While it doesn't specify amounts, it kind of gives some context as to what is expected in terms of paying minimum wage and all of that and ensure that you, you know, remain in the confines of the law. Um, all right, one more question. Can someone with a full working visa right apply for the grant? It uh, depends which one we're talking about here, but I, we do require that applicants are um, Australian citizens or permanent residents. Um, if you're another team member on a game, I think we addressed this earlier around the um, creative control, primary creative control of the game being um, within the, you know, Australia, the, the con creative control of Australian citizens or permanent residents as well. So um, if you think that you're borderline, I'd encourage you to reach out to chat to someone in the um, program operations team to clarify. All right, fantastic. Look, we've sort of gone five minutes over already. We still have 29 open questions. I'm afraid we probably won't get to all of them. Um, but I would really like to thank Lee, Chet, and Amelia for all their hard work, for the fantastic work that they're doing in, uh, in Screen Australia, for getting this off the ground, for really covering the whole ecosystem from small indie to experimental and then complementing the DGTO. It is really, really great work. Thank you so much for continued support for the industry. Thank you so much for making yourself available for this webinar and answering all of these questions. And like I said, um, your questions will be heard. They're not just going to disappear. We'll share them with the team at Screen Australia. They can have a look through them and then see in how far they can be reflected um, on the website and in the FAQs. And you know, I would also encourage you to have a chat with them. They really are as friendly as they appear on screen, probably even friendlier in the real world. So um, you know, please reach out. So yeah, thank you team. It's really great work. Thanks, Thanks very much, sorry. Jens. Sorry for your us. question. Thanks, Thanks for attending, everybody. Uh, right. Should we also let it be known we're going to be at South by Southwest Sydney next Friday? So if anyone's yeah. Sydney-based or travelling to Sydney, we're going to be uh, doing a talk and then holding a mixer afterwards. So that's on the Friday of South by Southwest. So you can <laughs> take your question from the 29 and come and ask it then if you're going to be around. And I will add, scanning the questions, there are a lot that are answered in the guidelines. So your mission, if you didn't get your question answered, you can probably find the answer in the guidelines or FAQs. <laughs> very Thanks good very all right uh, well look thank you thank you so much for your time again great work and uh, thank you everybody for dialing in and um talk to you later take care bye Thanks very Thanks much. bye, bye.